Great. So welcome, everybody. Um, this is a session um, for the Smith Programs Abroad, um, and we're going to be talking about the risk advisory form um, as we are planning and hoping um, to be able to study abroad um, during next year. I'm Lisa Johnson, and I'm the Assistant Dean for International Study, um, and I'm joined as well by um, Dean Rebecca Hubby, um, who's also in the Office for International Study. And let me see where we go. Hold on just a second. I'm trying to advance the slides and the, there. Um, so what we wanted to talk about um, is to let you know um, how we are going to be assessing um, risk. Um, and actually, I think um, this is Rebecca's slide. I apologize, Rebecca, for jumping in. Um, if you want to take it over, um, go right ahead. Yeah, um, well, actually, why don't we keep it on your PowerPoint? Um, and then when we get to the next slide, I'd like to um, switch PowerPoint so I can control the slide. But let me, let me start with this. Sorry. Thank you, everybody, for you know being patient with our technical dimensions here, being in two different places and working off a single PowerPoint. Um, what a year this has been! Um, you know, when you think about you know students who were abroad last spring and had to go home, and then over the summer we were waiting to see if we could study abroad in the fall and not even knowing then, you know, if the pandemic would last this long. We thought it's, it'll be over by summer, not a problem. Um, and we formed a risk advisory group. It's called, we call it SARAG, the Study Abroad Risk Assessment Advisory Group that has um, faculty and staff here at Smith that work on, you know, really like every single little detail of what's happening in different countries and what's happening with different programs and whether they meet our criteria. And we had been meeting weekly all the way up until January. We took a little bit of break. Of a break. So we've got a, a good structure for how we assess risk and how we think about um, what's manageable and what conditions students um, would go into. And then Lisa, let's do the little switch around. If you can stop sharing and I'll share my PowerPoint. You might have to make me a co-host. So um, can everyone see, see the PowerPoint now for me? Okay. So when we started thinking about this question of um, the responsibility we have of you know, really ensuring if we're gonna approve study abroad that we've done our best job of assessing risk and um, ensuring you know, to the greatest extent possible that we think it is, um, it's a tolerable risk, right? There's risk in everything, but the question is whether it's manageable and whether it's something that students can make their own decision about. So first and foremost, as we looked at this, was we wanted to ensure that if we were going to approve a program that we felt that the safety and welfare of students, staff, faculty, and the host community um, were the priority because it's not just a risk for us to think about going to a location, but the community also is, is a, a concern. And I know that even for Smith College, that was one of the questions that came up around welcoming students back to campus was, well, what will be the impact on the broader Northampton community? So the, you know, just basic kind of, is this safe question was, was first and foremost. And then the second um, question that was really important was, you know, what what will the academics be like? You know, do we really want to send students to a program where it's all going to be remote and you're in lockdown in a room and studying Zoom? You know, is that an experience that makes it um, worthwhile in terms of approving a program? And this became um, just especially important to think about, you know, if also you have, we had to have another early departure like we did a year ago, and, you know, would the program be able to, as we're now everybody's sick of hearing, pivot and 
then change, right? If maybe they had been in person and then they would have to go remote. Did they have the capacity to do that? We also, um, you know, had really hard questions about what is the value of cultural immersion um, in this kind of a situation where you don't know how much of it's going to be remote, how much, how much of it's going to be in person, and you actually travel very much in the location. And we have, have had, you know, from when we created these principles over the past year, had the benefit actually of seeing some of the positive things that come out of virtual online learning. There's been some really interesting conversations about the value of greater accessibility and um, you know, even having, having sessions recorded so that you can watch them later if for some reason you can't be present. So there, there's been pros and cons about this that have been um, interesting and have opened up some really valuable conversations for, for study abroad post-pandemic. Um, and then we really wanted to think about, you know, the Smith culture, right? It's to the, this extent, you, you know, this is for Smith pro programs and for Smith students going abroad. Um, we always emphasize that, you know, when students go, they represent the college and they follow the, the college um, guidelines and code of conduct. So to the extent that we're all thinking about culture of care and, um, how to be flexible, how to think about equity and inclusion, how do we do that in a way um, in you know, this new scenario and with new, new issues that we're, we're dealing with. So let me just be very specific then, like what is the work that this advisory group did in assessing the criteria? And I'm gonna walk through these really quickly, but we wanna be transparent and we want you all to know sort of the, the background of this and the hard work that we have been doing and are gonna to continue to do. And we'll actually talk about that a little bit more um, when we discuss the travel waiver, because um, some of the countries are still, right now they're still in lockdown and there's, you know, travel is still difficult. So we are gonna be monitoring them throughout the spring and summer. So first of all, um, are there delays in getting passports or visas? That has been an issue. Um, I think luckily for, for our own programs, um, my understanding is that students are going to be able to get visas. So that was something that we were able to, to check off as like, this is going to be possible. Are there travel restrictions in and out of different countries? This has also been something we've been monitoring and um, ensuring that, you know, related to the visa where they can get a student visa, will they allow students in even when there's travel restrictions for tourism? And also I should say for that, sometimes it's an amount of time. Like you could be a student, but you have to be in for more than 90 days in different countries. So it's different country by country and our directors have been really great in helping us stay on top of that. We look at the State Department and the Centers for Disease Control advisories, and those links are in the travel waivers that you would have received. Our, um, our risk commit, um, committee has also looked at, you know, what are the healthcare systems? And are they, um, are they capable of handling um, a level of illness? Um, if, you're, if you're sick, are there facilities open that could care for you? And even if it's not COVID related, you know, if, if we're he's saying hospitalization capacity levels are maxed out, that there's literally very little room in ICUs, we're also wondering, well, what if you're in a bike accident? Or what if you have some other unrelated um, crisis that, you know, would require hospitalization? Is there the capacity to um, be treated in country or, or with our insurance maybe evacuated? Um, this we this is interesting because the program provider having contingency plans. We when we started this, we were looking at a lot of our other approved programs and whether they had contingency plans, and so that has prompted us to develop our own, which we will be publishing very soon. Um, and our directors, some of whom are on this call, have done a huge amount of work to make sure we've got contingency plans for different levels of of this. Um, how are we handling student health and safety? We have gone over and over and over what our quarantine provisions are, what to do if a student is ill with COVID, do we have an evacuation plan, testing protocol, et cetera. As I mentioned earlier, the plan for academic continuity, either like 
you know, are we starting um, in a kind of remote or like Smith, you know, enhanced remote and then going in person or vice versa? Do we have the flexibility to move between those modes of instruction? We've also looked at restrictions on independent travel while um, you're on the program. And the reason for this, you know, is partly to, to minimize COVID um, exposure, but also as we've been watching over the past year, we've seen real unpredictability about when different countries decide to just close their borders. So, you know, in the pre-pandemic era when students would travel on the weekends all over and, you know, could manage, you know, maybe from Florence going to London or going to um, Berlin and back in a weekend, that's gonna be trickier um, in these conditions. And so we'll probably have some limits on, on that kind of independent travel or at least notifying us of when there would be travel and, and signing something saying, you realize that you'd be taking a risk of possibly not getting back. And there wouldn't be much that we would be able to do in those circumstances. But there's a good positive side of that. It means you're, you're there on site learning more and exploring the local culture that you're in. Um, and then finally, you know, because the college does have to think about long-term sustainability, we've been looking at financial risk and um, for us, but also for you. So, you know, we've allowed the deferral of the deposit and a, you know, a refund right up until departure. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about airfare and other fees that we would refund. And so I'm gonna hand it back to Lisa for this part. And any questions on that before I hand this back to Lisa? Any of these questions? Rebecca, why don't you continue sharing your screen and just drive the PowerPoint? Okay. And I'm sorry, any questions? Yeah, any questions before we shift back? No, I can't see everyone's hands. So um, just speak up if you have questions. No? Okay, we'll move along. Lisa. So um, one of the things we were hoping, um, you know, to kind of set the stage for is to think about what it might mean um, to study abroad during a pandemic. Um, and both um, Rebecca and myself and our um, on-site program staff, you know, have quite extensive experience in working with students who are studying abroad. But this is at least is my first experience in working with students um, during a pandemic um, and stuff. And so it's important to think about, you know, what that's going to look like for you and mean for you, um, as well as also know that we're thinking about these things too, right? Um, as Rebecca mentioned, we're thinking about how to manage uncertainty um, regarding the changing pandemic trends. Um, and what are we going to do if X, Y, or Z situation presents itself um, in terms of border closings or public guidelines um, and stuff. And we're hopeful when um, we publish our um, contingency plans, you know, there will be information for each of your countries um, directly to those governmental um, websites that are saying, okay, this country is in level orange right now, and this what that's what this means for you um, and stuff. So you can be thinking about some different scenarios. Interestingly, what we did with these is also plan the scenarios to be as similar um, in nature as the ones that are on campus right now. So you know, a least restrictive mode, a moderate re moderate release re restrictive mode, um, and a, a very restricted mode um, and stuff. And so. Hopefully, um, you know, you're already a little bit used to that. Um, can you go back, Rebecca? Sure. Um, you're a little bit used to that. Um, but, um, you know, if you're not, start thinking about this. So things that we'll be thinking about, um, you know, what happens, as Rebecca mentioned, if local courses are scheduled to start remotely um, or sw switch to remote instruction, um, we can manage that with the Smith courses. Um, it becomes a little bit trickier to do with the universities where you're taking classes. But nevertheless, again, we're looking into that um, and we're trying to um, plan accordingly, depending on the scenario. Looking again at public health guidelines um, and how are they differing from Massachusetts and from Smith campus um, and stuff. And so we're trying to align those guidelines as much as possible. Um, there's some differences. Certainly there's some differences um, in terms of what is considered the right distance for social distancing or what is considered the right 
um, capacity in a classroom um, or so on and so forth um, and stuff. And so we're looking at all of those moving pieces to try to align them as much as possible. We also are thinking about how isolated a student might um, feel um, if they, you know, what with a student lived experience if the culture would be. Um, we want you out and you want to be out um, interacting with your host nationals as much as possible. Um, but if that's not possible, you know, what, what kind of impact does that have on the study abroad experience um, and your own, you know, goals um, for studying abroad? And then would the, the resulting experience meet your vision of study abroad? It's, so, it's similar, you know, and, and your goals and your cultural expectations um, for your, your games while you're abroad. So next slide. So as I mentioned, again, we're modeling um, our um, contingency plans um, similar to what's on campus, um, but translating that into the individual locations where you would be studying abroad, you know, least restrictive, um, moderately restrictive, and most restrictive. Um, where, and it's interesting, it's been challenging um, because as Rebecca mentioned, um, we're basing some of our decisions and discussions about the current situation. Right. We're also very hopeful that that the that today's reality will look significantly different in August or September um, and stuff. But nevertheless, in in order to do our due diligence um, for planning and making sure that our students are you know supported in the ways they need to be supported and remain as safe as possible, we have to plan for the most restrictive and what would that look like as well as think about what would moderately and least restricted to do. And as Rebecca mentioned, our on-site staff are working dil diligently to um, think about three different scenarios for the programs and stuff. Okay, next slide. Great. This, I don't I remember, Rebecca's this year oh, with me. Is that right? Um. I think this one's yours still. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, after the, the nine criteria um, that we looked for that Rebecca mentioned earlier, once we um, look at those criteria and we will be um, likely um, eliminating some study, study abroad destinations um, based on the first nine criteria, um, because we know, for example, there are some destinations not in Europe as of yet, um, where students can travel. Um, we know New Zealand, for example, has not yet opened its borders. Um, so students who are hoping to study abroad in New Zealand, unfortunately, that's not gonna be an option for them. Australia is right behind New Zealand. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen an official announcement yet, but it's likely to come soon. So we're looking at those uh, situations. Also, um, if there's a level four um, travel advisory by this, the, the State Department um, and, a, and a level three for CDC, that's likely going to um, have the SARAG um, group decide that's probably not safe for students to study abroad. Once we narrow that down, we're going to be looking at a series of countries and destinations, and we're going to be looking at take a deeper dive and looking at these um, metrics, right? We're calling them the, the tripwire metri metrics. And so we will be um, doing a weekly assessment um, of these four criteria, um, the seven day and 14 day interval positivity rates, um, the number of new cases by seven day new cases as per 100,000 population, and a percentage of trend in new cases um, if they're increasing and, and, and decreasing. You may have heard some of these numbers already referenced um, in Massachusetts or wherever you're living. Um, and stuff. And for example, um, test positivity, positivity rate, generally we want to be around 5%. Um, if it's lower than that, um, that's great. Um, if it's higher than that, that's going to raise some alarms um, and stuff. So you might have heard what, um, you know, in your own, like I said, your own locations, or if you're in Massachusetts, what the, the states are actually doing, the individual states are doing, following is similar to these um, metrics. And then we all know topic of, 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 you know, um, of the headlines right now of vaccination rates. Um, and are there countries um, who are vaccinating their residents um, faster um, or you know, by hopefully August or September, there will be a significant number of people who have already been vaccinated. Um, and what does that mean in terms of our decision-making process? 
And any questions on any of this? We're gonna, the next slide is gonna um, shift us to looking um, in detail at the COVID travel advisory form that you received. So I'm gonna um, get out of the PowerPoint and stop sharing. And hold on just a second. I'm going to bring up the form. First of all, did everybody get the form? Do you know what form I'm talking about? When I show it to you, maybe you'll. Um... I could have shown it to you on the PowerPoint, but I'm trying to pull it up as well. Hold on a second. OK. Um, So you would have gotten a form that looks like this, addendum to the study broad acknowledgement of risk, release, indemnification, and hold harmless. Does that bring, ring a bell? No? Lisa, did that go out in their conditional approval? Um, it should have. I'm checking um, some students who are shaking their heads. It would have been an attachment to the email that you received that said study abroad application conditionally approved. And it's attachment, um, and I could see at least one student who I saw saying that they had not received it. It wasn't it. Okay, you got it, Samantha. Perfect. Okay. So um, there's there's two particular paragraphs I want to to bring to your attention, and I know some of these forms you read them, you're like, oh my gosh, there's so many legal details in here, and um, we apologize for that. I mean, these are sort of standard waivers that I know my own kids all had to sign for like anything, soccer camp or, you know, playing playing baseball or whatever. And so study abroad is one more um, activity like that that does require these sort of risk acknowledgement waivers. But the, the two paragraphs that we really want to point out are um, here, the Department of State Travel Advisory. Well, this one is the Travel Advisory for France the Centers for Disease Control and the um, U.S. Embassy's COVID um, updates. And I'm gonna just, um, rather than try to link through them, I'm gonna go right there to them. So if you go to example, this U.S. State Department, when you click through, and this would be different for each of your countries, but we've got that, that click, you can go in there and you can see what level they're at. France is at a level three. Rebecca, and, Rebecca we're still seeing um, the waiver. Oh, you are. That's interesting. I'm, um, yeah. What is the waiver? Now do you see this? No, we're see still seeing the everything? waiver. Okay, I think what we have to do is stop. I think we have to share. There is an option that says advanced and like that when you move around your computer, you can you can see when you move. Say that again. There is an option when you start sharing that it says advance. Um, and then when you move to your computer, you, we can see that where you're sharing. Interesting. Yeah, because I've done it before and I've been able to see it. But I'll just stop sharing and then share again for these questions. Okay. So. <laughs> it's hard to learn a new trick and talk at the same time. Um, but can you see the, the State Department um, page for France? Okay, great. Um, so, you know, this has, you know, key information here. You can link to the embassy COVID page, but we've also given you that link. They also have the link to the CDC page. And it's just good to check this from time to time. Um, some countries, there's less of, there's, you know, COVID is a concern around the world, but there may be other concerns. And so you'll see, um, you know, for France and in other parts of Europe, local, Concerns about terrorism is still an issue. But anything that you you know that sort of are are things for you to be aware of, and you know, so that there's fair disclosure and that you know um, what what at least the U.S. State Department is saying about travel to Europe. For level threes, again, you know that's part of why we are requiring the travel waiver. Um, if it was a level four, we would say do not travel. And that's a pretty firm State Department um, warning. The Centers for Disease Control, I'm going to um, share that with you. Could 
Can I ask a question real quick about the um, witness to signature line? Sure. Yeah. Um, just what are you specifically looking for in that? Would it be okay if the witness like watched us sign it over a FaceTime call or something, or does it have to be a person who we interact with, you know, in real life? <laughs> Good question. Um, that's the first time somebody's asked us that question in this period. I think, yeah, if they witness it over FaceTime um, or, you know, any creative way that you have, of, of, you know, you have your cell phone and say, okay, I'm witnessing this. Um, they, um, actually, let me look at this again, because I think they have to, um, sign it. And so we'd have to get a second copy with their signature, or you can send it to them and they could attach their signature. That's a, we, that's a good question. Lisa, we're going to have to talk through that to so give some hints on how to get that done. Thank you for bringing that up. Another another related question that we get about that. So um, your witness does not need to be somebody official like a notary public or you know something of that nature. It needs to be somebody who knows you well. Most witnesses are parents or siblings or close friends. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, just showing you the CDC page now. That's one of the links that's in that waiver. Um, the CDC is taking a much um, more cautionary stance on international travel than the US State Department. But again, you'll see kind of key metrics there and um, you know, just their general recommendation. And then Wait, Rebecca, can you go back to the top? Can you, can you show the CDC one for France again um, at the top? The interesting thing about that is you see the two new travel requirement that's posted. Um, so France is saying that in order to be allowed to enter the country, you will be required to have a negative COVID test um, or documentation before you board your flight. So thinking about that, um, is important to plan accordingly. And I would actually recommend that everybody plan that anyway within three <clears throat> days of your flight because um, we had a situation recently where the country had required it literally right before the students were about to depart and people were students were scrambling to, to get the test. So it just doesn't hurt to make sure you are, are registered somewhere to get a test and have results um, immediately prior to departure. And then the last one is that I'm gonna share with you is what the embassy page looks like because I find this is the most helpful page. Um, when you, this is, um, again, I showed you before the State Department has the link to it, but we put it, the direct link in that travel waiver. Um, and because this has actual local information so you can see here, you know, now it gives you real details. Right now they have a stay at home curfew. Um, you have to have an exemption certificate. There's different regions that are in the lockdown. So here is where you can really get the more detailed, um, kind of looking at what's happening and, and, and checking. I check every week or so, because it'll change and um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, kind of the ups and downs as countries sort of hopefully get out of this pandemic era. And I also wanted to point out here, it says here, um, you know, are US citizens permitted to enter? It says no, but further down in information about um, exemptions, there are exemptions for what they call critical travel categories and that includes students. So that's where, you know, you can dig around and you can find out more information about that. I'm going to keep going from there because I want to show one more time um, another aspect of this form that we talked about. This travel risk advisory. Oh dear. Can you see the form? Are you seeing the form now? No, it 
it keeps wanting to. <laughs> Sorry for these technical challenges. It wants to take me back to the previous site I was on. Okay, are you seeing the form? Yes, okay. Now I've lost the form. Lisa, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the form or a website? I'm seeing the second page of the form um, in Word. Okay, great. The most important part of this risk um, waiver are the conditions around the pandemic, right? So the first section 3A is just making sure everybody is aware of that. That's like a statement of fact that um, there is this worldwide pandemic and a little bit of information about that. We you know, point out that there's a lot of uncertainty. So 3B, community outbreaks cannot be predicted. Um, some of the concerns are that we don't know at any given time um, what kind of screening is available, if, what treatment is available, or the level of evacuation. We do have insurance, but depending on, you know, you know conditions, we, we, we may or may not be able to be evacuated for treatment. So, you know, just general, there may be limits to travel. There's an acknowledgement that you may be subject to quarantine. Again, that's changing literally week by week for different countries. That you, if you have pre existing conditions, that you should definitely check with a medical professional and consider whether travel is appropriate. Um, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time talking about is this 3D that what happens if I get sick? What happens if I contract COVID 19? Um, initially, when COVID hit, if somebody was sick, you could not travel. They were not allowing people to travel home while you were sick. We have talked about to our insurance company and they said they are making occasional exceptions for students who are very ill and um, can be transported to a place where there's better, better treatment. But in general, you can't just get on a commercial flight um, if, you, if you're sick. And part of the problem is that you may not be able to have family travel to the country either. So, you know, sort of, you know, one of the issues here is that, you know, often people are sick and they have to be in the hospital alone only with, with telephones for communication. Um, the, other, the other concern that we really want people to be aware of is what happens if you, if you aren't feeling well, you get COVID, you're sick, but you're not sick enough to go to the hospital, but because of local guidelines, they re require social isolation. So if that happens, we do have um, provisions in each country where we have a location where students can be socially isolated. So you could be there for 10 to 14 days and only have access to telemedicine and rely on delivery of meals and things on your own. So that, you know, that's just a basic reality, but I think we wanna be sure that everyone um, you know, take that into consideration and your own comfort level with that should you get sick, that there may be a period of social isolation. We will, of course, you know, assist with making sure that you have the ability for meals to be delivered and, you know, someone's checking in on you by phone and making sure you're, you're not completely isolated from communications, but it would mean in terms of contact with other people, there'd be isolation. And then finally, you know, to acknowledge in 3E that the local conditions are going to be different than they are here, either in Massachusetts or other parts of the U.S. or certainly on campus. And that um, for the most part, you know, while we can control the space within our Smith Center and our own classrooms, we'll be following local public guidelines for your interactions and immersion in the local culture. So that's the important stuff I wanted to really emphasize about um, this waiver and, um, you know, again, to, to thank you for understanding our need to have these for you to, um, to read and sign and have your parents or guardians sign so that um, we can do, you know, we can be careful in sending you abroad. 
Lisa, do you want me to go back to the PowerPoint or do you want to drive it from here? Stop sharing. Whatever is easiest for you. Um, I can bring it up. So um, anticipating some of the questions to come up um, as you we slowly but surely take baby steps towards studying abroad. Um, these are the, the most common questions we've um, we've been fielding thus far. Um, so will you be reimbursed for costs if your program is suspended? So as of right now, Smith is saying conditionally it look, it's looking OK. We're going to be conducting the assessment. We'll be keeping people posted um, and things like that um, and stuff. But there's still the risk that at some point the situation could deteriorate and we would decide that study abroad is not um, going to be supported. If that's the case, um, we if you have spent any money um, for your visa fees, um, you, we will reimburse you for that. Um, that pertains to um, Italy and France um, as of right now. I don't think there's a fee for Switzerland, at least there wasn't, um, but that may have changed. Um, if you're required to take a language placement test um, as part of the university registration, or if there's a university registration fee, um, we will reimburse you for that. Um, and that information um, will be coming to you shortly um, um, in terms of which programs need to do an early language requirement if there's a fee or a university registration partner, okay? Um, and then airfare, um, and this is the trickiest part. Um, we The college will reimburse up to $300 for a change fee or a cancellation fee, right? Um, and cancellation fees may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this is tricky um, because we highly recommend that you purchase a ticket um, that has flexible um, dates and, you know, um, ideally little to no cancellation fees um, and stuff. Those, those tickets will likely be a little bit more expensive, but um, in this day and age of uncertainty, it's something that you really would have to invest in. Remember that if you receive financial aid from the college, um, you would be eligible for an airfare stipend um, and um, that will help you offset those costs um, for your airfare. Um, so um, be looking you know, for more information on that um, as we move forward. Should you register for fall semester classes at Smith starting in April? Yes, right? So you'll soon if, um, be, um, be the first to test um, at a registration, um, course registration and workday. Woo-woo! Um, and you will want to do that in April. So, and the reason for that is we're going to um, have you registered in classes. And Rebecca, can you check, um, click on the next one? No, um, go back up. Oh, so, okay. You have a different version of the presentation. Um, so there was another bullet point on the previous slide about housing. Um, and um, the, you will also be wanting to participate in room draw um, for housing. Um, and that also, also it will be happening in April. So the idea is to have you registered in classes and have you register for room draw, you know, up until as close as we can um, to departure and have the highest level of certainty that you will actually be going abroad. Um, so that again, should we have to make the determination to not, um, to not allow study abroad, you won't be missing out um, on the continuity of your Smith education um, in terms of fall semester classes and housing. So um, if you could um, please do those, that'd be great. Okay, I think that's all that we have to say. Um, we're gonna open it up now to questions and maybe Rebecca, you can stop sharing um, your screen. Yeah, and there are questions in the chat. Um, so um, Lisa, there's one about international students applying for their visa in their home country. Do you want to answer that since you're doing um, 
Likely. Um, I'll have to admit it's um, new territory for me. Um, normally, we're doing visa application processes from campus, um, and most international students are applying for their study abroad visas for, um, at the, U, the consulates here in the US. Um, it, um, I will probably be need to be working with the directors to figure out how to navigate that in the individual countries where the um, international students are currently located. But the answer in general would be yes, because we don't want to sending your passport um, from your home country to the US. It's too much of a risk. And, um, there's a question about for other students, do they need to make arrangements by themselves? Maybe you want to address how it's different for each program. Um, sure. Uh, so in most instances, we try to do what we call a batch processing where we gather all of the visa information um, and we present them to the consulates as a batch. Um, and that's true for Switzerland. Um, that's true for Italy. Um, it's a little bit different for France, but we do also provide a lot of support um, for the French visa process. Um, again, um, that's normally when everybody's on campus. Um, I still have not yet had the chance to think through what that will look like with not everybody being on campus. So with that said, we will do our utmost to um, support you with the visa process as much as we can. Yeah, and there's a question here about this, about housing and course registration for spring students. I'm just entering in the chat that we don't know yet because the whole college is sort of taking things one semester at a time. Um, so we were, we just confirmed what was possible for the fall, but we imagine that for the spring, it will be similar. The you know, people in housing and the registrar have been really fabulous of wanting to make sure all of you have backup plans in case things change. Right. If you're not, if you're not going to, if you're not going abroad, planning to be abroad for spring 2020 until spring 2022, then yes, you would in April be registering for your classes and participating in room draft. Um, as as you would because in theory you'll be on campus for the fall um and then we um will work through that process um for if and when we're ready to go to spring 2022 um, and departure for that so it's a different cycle um with that said while you're all abroad or those who will be abroad during spring 2022 from abroad you will also be participating in course registration and room draw um for fall of 2022 um, there's a question from Tish Rosabel and then Anna Tierney. Tish, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I was wondering if you know services like uh, VFS Global or things like that are still working and everything is just like going, sending things by mail. I've done it before for just like a short stay visa as a student. I just like went to Boston and dealt with it for a day and came back, but I don't know what it would look like for uh, yeah, um, it, in theory, yes, it's again, it's not something I've had a chance to look into yet, because um, we're busy with the assessment part to make sure we, you know, the college is, is you know, um, going to be comfortable with sending students abroad. But once, um, you know, I'll be looking into that for sure and making sure that everybody has the instructions they need in order to follow the visa process application. And stuff. That's a good question, though. And you will like you will be going through VFF, VS, VFS, um, at least for France, for sure. Um, Anna Tudney, you have a question. Thank you. Um, I I guess I had a couple questions. One, just to clarify, even if we're planning on hopefully being abroad in the fall, we should still register for classes at Smith and housing at Smith. And then if we get to go abroad, do we just drop those classes? And I, I, yeah, and I'll do that. Um, if you get to go abroad, I will be in touch with the housing office and with um, the registrar's office. Um, to let to let them know that your your status is, will be changed um, to study abroad leave, um, and when that status changes, then um, you get um, all of your other registrations get removed. Okay, thank you. And then I was wondering, I'm planning on studying abroad for the full year if I can. So if we can't go this fall, could I then go in the spring and kind of do an internship or something over the summer and then stay through the next fall? Because I'm just curious about how we could try to make this um, work if things go wrong for this fall. Yeah, I would say um, for the year long students, that is definitely an option um, to think about um, because 
one of the things that we're talking about in all of our four sites is, is capacity um, and with social distancing involved. Um, so if you're a year long student, then you're already counted within that capacity determination. Um, for fall semester students, um, it will depend on whether or not there's capacity um, for the spring semester to allow you to switch. So would we, would we, if we had to do that, would we reapply for next, next fall? Um, I, I don't know that I understand that question. Sorry. Um, so if we end up not being able to go next fall, and if we instead tried to go spring 2022 and fall 2023, then would we have to reapply for fall 2023? Like, over the summer or yeah yes you would um and um the reason for that is because our system doesn't allow for us to roll over applications from one academic year to the other so you would have to uh, apply for acceptance to the program for fall 2022 and by february 2022. thank you I do want to say, though, it's very possible, and that was the situation that our students um, who had been planning to be abroad this year found themselves in, right? That, every, you know, we had a whole year that was put on hold, and some of those students are applying to go in the fall, and they had to go through that. And process. they're here. I, some of them, I recognize a oh, lot yeah. of names. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there's at least three yeah. or four. Um, oh, my gosh. more. Oh, I want to send you all a big hug. <laughs> You've just, wow, oh, what a roller coaster. What a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. We have our two of our directors, um, Marie Madeleine from um, Paris is here and Monica from Florence. I don't see, so do you see anybody else here? Javier or Elsie? No. Um, do you want to say hello or just like introduce yourselves and let people know what, you know, I don't know, just what's life sure. like right now for you? <laughs> Marie Madeleine, why don't you go first? Hi, my name is Marie Madeleine. I already met some students. I recognize some students also because we had our first virtual meeting last Wednesday and we talked about like different options of housing and, and all that. I hope and cross my finger that I'll see you in person in September. <laughs> and Monica? Hi, I'm Monica. Um, I don't know, maybe Samantha uh, is coming to Florence, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody else in this group is coming. And uh, uh, Anna, <laughs> ciao. Um, and Sophia and uh, I am planning on meeting you uh, in the next uh, few weeks, anyway, in the month of April. So we will talk about housing and we'll give you pre-departure information. And uh, same as Marie Madeleine and everybody else, we are keeping our fingers crossed and we hope that uh, your experience will be possible this year after so much pain. <laughs> so... Italy is uh, uh, giving so many vaccines right now. So we hope that the situation will improve dramatically over the summer. So let's keep our fingers crossed. I hope to see you. If you have any questions, please be in touch with me or let me know. Any other questions from anyone? No, Lisa, any final thoughts you want to leave with them? No, I just thank you for coming. Um, and thank you for your resilience as well um, for all of the students um, who are thinking about studying abroad, be it um, if you're rising, you're soon to be rising seniors or soon to be rising juniors. Um, you know, I think that um, your high levels of resilience um, throughout this past year will serve you well um, for the study abroad experience. Um, and as we've mentioned, we're all hoping that really happens <laughs> and stuff. So, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, those who have met with me before will know that I will say every single time, I'd rather you ask a hundred million questions 
than not have enough information um, to make informed decisions about your study about experience. So please don't be shy about that um, and just reach out um, and we'll make sure that you have the information you need. And if any of your parents or guardians, you know, when you ask them to sign that form, they're like, what is this? <laughs> if they want to talk to um, one of us, you know, please, you know, Lisa and I are available. We're happy to talk to, um, to parents about what's going on and reassure them that, um, you know, we're here for you. And we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't feel good about the quality of care, um, you know, Monica and Rima, the land, we just, you know, we, we've worked really hard for the past year of really putting all the pieces in place that we need to make it work. Not unlike, you know, being on campus right now. So, and I'm on campus, this is my office here. I came in for my weekly test. <laughs> so we want to make it happen and we're doing everything we can and we're happy to talk to you or your parents or guardians or whoever to, um, provide whatever reassurance you can. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll let people go. We know everyone's busy and it's Friday. <laughs> and it's- uh, And it's late at night and- Late at <laughs> night, it's dinner time over there in Florence and Paris. So um, yeah, bon weekend. <laughs>